So now let's understand how you kind of gonna tackle tackle this thing, right? So that was first approach. The first approach is called an univariate method. What are you gonna do in this? It's pretty simple, right? What can you do with an outlier? Uh, just just drop them off, right? That's the most simple and the most intuitive thing that you could do with an outlier. And that's exactly what we are doing. So the steps are very simple to do this. First, visualize all your algorithm, visualize all your features in a 2D plot or a 3, if you can, if you are trying to plot categorical versus numeric, then a box plot, use whatever plot is convenient and basically from that figure out which are the data points, which are outlier and then figure out that what is the threshold, right? Beyond which you would call something as outlier. After that visual intuition you have, you drop off those points above the threshold and that's how you get rid of outliers. That's as simple as that. So to kind of get an idea, let's do this again. So now what we do was now we had an intuition, right? When we plotted sales price versus living area. When we earlier did that, we had a data points. There were two data points which were towards the bottom right, right? Which we had seen. So now you have, when you apply a criteria like this, that living area is greater than 3000 or living area is less than 6000. So in what you have done is you basically applied thresholds which were basically above which the outliers were residing. So now because you have applied this threshold, you have got rid of those outliers, right? So now let's try and see how the data looked earlier and how the data. So clearly you can see here there were two data points like this and there were two data points like this, right? So these were clearly the outliers which we wanted to remove. And by applying manually the threshold about 3000 and less than 6000, we got rid of all of these data points, right? So that sounds like a pretty easy technique, right? So all you have to do is for every feature, visualize them on 2D and then or for all the features, all you have got to do is visualize them on 2D and figure out basically which are the points that look outlier to you, right? So there's a visual interpretation that is associated with this. So obviously, as you can understand, this is not the most robust algorithm or the not the most robust way per se to kind of deal with outliers, but definitely a sound one because if you're visualizing them, you have a very good intuition about uh, which one are the outliers, right? So now the obviously, as I had mentioned that these are not the most robust ways of you know, dealing with an outlier. So what are some more sophisticated ways we can deal with outlier, right? Because you cannot ideally, if you say, for example, you are going through, you're having a data set, which has around hundred features, right? Now imagine going through each of those hundred or hundred across, you know, hundred plots per se, right? And figuring out what are the threshold for each of those hundred features. That's definitely not something that is very easy to do. So for that, we have to come up with something that is a little more uh, sophisticated and then a little more, uh, I would say easier to apply, right? So what are those some of the methods? So first method is called something called multivariate method. So what we did was a univariate method. In multivariate method, we are going to figure out in univariate, we were looking at each of the feature individually and then figuring out based on that feature, which data point is an outlier. In multivariate, we are going to look at all the features together and then figure out which data point is an outlier, right? So one of the technique is using clustering methods to basically identify. So clustering method is nothing. And this obviously we would be covering in more detail in the unsupervised learning techniques. But to kind of give you an idea, if you have a lot of data out here, right? You have a lot of data out here, right? And then you have one particular data like this, or maybe one or couple of them, right? So if you use clustering, you would see that all of this data belongs to cluster one, C1, and all of this ones belong to another cluster C2, right? So from this, you can very easily identify using unsupervised techniques of clustering that if there are outlier points, which are clustered together, right? So this is an easy way. So this is an easy way to kind of do uh, outlier detection on a scale, right? Because when you, as I was explaining, you have 100, 200 features, you cannot be going through each of those 100 features and figuring out intuitively what is the best way, right? So in those kind of cases, it's much more easier to visualize them or not sorry, not visualize them to just use clustering methods to figure out which is the, which are the points which are not really, you know, lying in the meat of the data, right? So the, which are the ones which are lying very far from the distribution. So clustering is one easy technique. The second technique is dimensionality reduction and we'll definitely talk about it more when we kind of get into the unsupervised techniques. Uh, I'll make sure we talk about it a lot more because talking about it right now, you probably would not be able to appreciate it completely. But just understand this, what you're trying to always do is basically you have data in a lot of high dimension and you're using some technique to reduce them down into two dimension and then do visual plotting, right? So it's something very similar to that. You have a high dimension data, 100, 200 features. 
somehow bring it down to two dimension and then plot the outliers. But how all of this technique kind of goes around, neither with clustering or with dimensionality reduction, you would not be able to appreciate right now. So we'll go that and do that in the unsupervised lectures. So now this is the third, third method how to tackle outliers, which is basically, uh, I would say, a more of a tweak uh, and more of a slight uh, trick of hand, which is basically, you know what, let's not tackle the data. Let's tackle the algorithm. Let's build a algorithm which is so robust that it can tackle for outlier data itself, right? So we have seen linear regression. We have, as of now, studied linear regression. And we clearly see that linear regression is not something which is more robust to, you know, outlier kind of data. But then linear regression is not the end of the world and we are going to cover a lot more sophisticated algorithms in the coming days. When we do that, you would be able to appreciate a lot more that there are much better algorithms with, uh, compared to linear regression which can handle outliers. And that's exactly what we are going to use sometimes to tackle for outlier, right? So that's the idea. And with that in mind, let's now go into the second part of the lecture, which was about handling missing values. So uh, we, are, we, are, we are very happy doing the outlier detection task and everything, right? But then there's something which is more critical than outlier, because in outlier, at least you could fit a data. A lot of times when if you have a missing data, you cannot even fit an algorithm. You would get a NumPy error right away while fitting, right? So you need to tackle missing data more stringently than you probably need to take care of outlier because you might come up with algorithms which can tackle for outlier data, but it's much more tougher to come up with algorithms that tackle for missing data. So that's what we are going to do and try and understand here. So what we have here in the back is this, right? So we have, so what we have done is we have taken the entire data set, which basically had any of those, any of the values as missing. So these are all the houses that you see here. So you see there are different IDs of the different houses. So you can, you can see here, these are the different IDs of the houses. And all you can see is the number of missing values that are there for each of those houses, right? So in the, out of those 80 features that we had or 79 features, you can see the first house has 15 missing values. The second one also has 15 missing values. So out of 80 or 15 values are missing. That's, that's a lot number, right? You cannot, uh, you cannot straight away ignore it. You have to come up with, some, obviously for linear regression or logistic regression or any of those simple algorithms that we are going to use, you are not, not even going to get away with even one missing value because if you have missing value, you would get an error. So you need to tackle missing value if we are trying to do linear regression. Even that means if there's one missing value, you have to tackle that. And now we are talking about 15 missing values out of 80. That's a huge lot, right? Huh? So we have to definitely come up with some way to tackle for that. So this is what obviously we saw there were houses which had 40. So the house number 40 had 15 missing values, right? Which is a lot. So how do we tackle that, right? Uh, so before we kind of get into the how you tackle missing values, let's take a bit of a moment and pause to understand uh, why is there a missing value in the first place, right? So does that, does this, does that mean anything? Does, what does that even talk about, right? So a lot of time what happens is uh, missing values are basically there because of someone not being careful enough on their job or someone not being, uh, you know, careful while the data was screened through them. So a lot of reasons can happen. So for example, you are at a hospital where your data is being collected, right? So you have your normal outpatient wards where people are collecting data from patients on a regular basis. Now, now there might be cases which are in emergency. You really don't have time to collect as much data from them, right? You are not going to stop someone in the middle of emergency. I'm like, hey, I think I have a very strong data collection process. I cannot have missing values. So I'm going to stop you right there and collect data from you. That's not going to happen, right? So there might be cases like this where you cannot, you don't have the time to collect data. So these are some of the business logic because of which you sometimes don't end up having data. Some other business, not business, but more of uh, coding logic, which kind of gives error is say sometimes you are scrolling, scrolling through websites and you are crawling through different products of on a particular page and you're trying to retrieve prices. Now your internet connection went off or something else happened and your crawling did not kind of get through at that particular moment. You, the crawling, basically your website crawling API gave you some wrong responses. So then you can end up with having missing values. So there are the reasons could be multitude. But the thing to understand is just because it's a missing value does not mean that it should be again be, you know, just like outliers. There's no particular definition of outliers and just because they're outlier does not mean they should be removed, right? I had talked about that in the earlier session as well. Uh, the same thing kind of applies here as well. Just because there's a missing value does not mean it should be removed. Probably there's a, so for example, if it's a hospital ward example, that one I gave you, right? Where people are not able to collect data in the emergency case. 
then and you're trying to predict from that basically whether someone would survive or not then you would know that if someone is in emergency there's a lot less chances of someone surviving than they are in the out when they're being treated in the normal hospital so in those kind of cases you know that just because you have a missing value uh, you have those missing values actually represent some signal so you really don't want to get rid of them completely right so So that is why we are going to try and tackle missing value in the best possible value. And like in outlier treatment, there's nothing which says that this is the, you know, this is the only one holy grail of how you tackle outliers or how you tackle missing value. There's nothing which says that this is the Bible and this is what you have to follow. This is, as I was explaining in the starting of the session, these are all engineering hacks. These are all the chances that you would get to display your creativity, your idea, your intuition about the data. So please don't try and memorize these rules. Don't try and think that these are the only rules possible these are just some of the sample rules you can go ahead and create your own new rules but for now let's understand what are some of the samples what are some of the uh, i would say guidelines some of the thumb rules that people use some of the most commonly used techniques to tackle missing data but this as i said these are commonly used does not mean you need to use them commonly so so first, the first and foremost thing is you first basically figure out what are the total number of missing rows. And obviously the most naive and intuitive thing that you can do out here is this, right? Which is, yeah, remove. Yeah, sounds, sounds, like, a, sounds like the most primitive thing people probably starting in their data science career would do something as naive as this. But let's go ahead with this, right? So the idea is this, that you probably find rows which are basically data points which has got missing value. If it has got any missing value, you just remove it, right? Just drop it from the column. So anything which has a missing value, just drop it. Any data point which has any missing value, just drop it, right? So now we see that when we do that, for this particular data set, we end up with a data set which is of the shape 0, 80. What does that mean? That means that we ended up dropping all our rows. So this is why 80 features, but we have zero rows, right? What does that mean? We have dropped our entire row just because our dropping logic was this, that if there's any row which has got any missing value, drop it. That clearly is not the best idea, right? So you have got ended up with absolutely dropping everything that you had. So as you can see here, John has ended up doing losing out on all the data, right? Because he has dropped all the rows. There's nothing that he can do, right? So this approach is very fine if your number of, as you can see here, this approach is very fine if your number of amount of missing data is very small, right? If if your every row, every every other row or every second, third row is tending to having missing values and all you're doing is drop out any row that has missing values, clearly that would backfire. So that's exactly what it is mentioned in the second point here that if you have a large number of scattered missing values you have every second third row which has got missing value every other row has got missing value you don't want to drop rows right because if you are dropping rows you will very sooner than enough you end up with a very small fraction of the data set right you don't want to lose out on that right so but here before we kind of explore some more advanced algorithms let's take a moment and understand this right so just a slightly better idea than dropping any row which has any missing value is basically dropping rows which has got all missing values. At least that is a decently good idea because if, if, if your, all your features are missing, right, your, for any particular data point, which is say any house, you have got every data point missing, which is you don't have its living area and nothing, nothing you have about it. So that data point is fairly useless, right? So you may want to drop off all rows which has got all missing values but definitely dropping any row which has got any missing value is definitely not a good idea because we would very sooner than enough sooner than enough we would end up losing a lot more data so yeah as if you do this do, do this approach where you're trying trying to just remove any rows which has got even which has got all the columns as missing then you would probably end up with still a sizable amount of data so this is definitely not a bad thing to do because that data point for which all the features are missing, uh, yeah, it's probably a, just just a meaningless data, right? There's, that's gibberish. So you, you want to definitely throw away that data. So that's fine. So obviously what did John's next idea is? John's next idea is, okay, I, I cannot probably drop all the rows which has got any missing value. How about dropping features, right? It's intuitive. 
you drop either rows or you drop features, right? So that's the second thing that is most intuitive to John. So John is like, okay, let's remove uh, all the columns that has got any missing values, right? So what he does is this, right? So what he counts is total number of missing values for each column. As you can see that pool QC has total 15438 missing values, right? So we had at the starting, we had somewhere around 1470 values to start off with and out of which 1438 values in pool QC are missing. So that means 99.72% of the data is actually missing for pool QC. Same for miscellaneous feature. You see that 96% of the data points for miscellaneous features are missing and for alley and fence and so on and so forth. So from this example, you can clearly see what is a, what is a good idea to do in this case. You can see that there are some examples which has got greater than 80% of the data missing, right? So you can clearly see that, okay, something has got greater than 80%. That means four-fifths of the data is missing. For every five rows, four rows have no data, right? So that is a that column really doesn't contain a lot of information. So it's very sparse information. And probably you should go ahead and do it is, you should just probably what you should do is just drop them off, right? If, if your column has 99% missing data, that means 100 rows you have one column one row which has got data right so definitely this is there's not much information in those kind of rows in those kind of features and might be a good idea to drop them please please emphasize on the word that it might be a good idea to drop them it's not necessarily a good idea to drop them because as i was explaining as i was explaining right now just a while back that in case of emergency example right so you don't you're not able to collect data but just because it's missing does not mean it's less informative probably in some of the data set it could mean that missing value basically means something very intuitive about the data so just because it's missing does not mean you should go ahead and remove that so first go out build an intuition of the data that's extremely critical while you do that right so go ahead do that and then only think about how you're going to tackle missing data but for this example in hand it's kind of clearly uh, I would not say it's intuitive, but it's it's a good measure, right? Instead of dropping rows, at least this is better, right? You are at least dropping three, four columns. So as you can see, as I was mentioning, pool QC, miscellaneous features and alley and fence are some of the features which has got greater than 80%. Now, this 80% number is also again something that I have while explaining you come up with, right? So there's nothing which says that only delete features which has got greater than 80%. You can go ahead and delete features which has got anything greater than 50% missing. So how do you come up with numbers? These numbers are something that is built out of your intuition about the data, about how well you understand the data. Also, if you lose out on features, do you, does it really make a lot of difference or not? So all of those things kind of contribute to understanding this. So taking this threshold greater than 80% is again something you build an intuition after you look at the data and all of this. So from here, you can see that if you drop 80% of your data, anything that has got greater than 80%, you're just losing out on uh, five, right? One, two, three, four. You're just losing out on four features. That is okay, right? Out of 80 features, you're losing out four features. But for some example, if you say, ex have a threshold which says anything which has got greater than 5% missing, I'm going to throw that away. So you can clearly see you would lose out a lot more features. So this is something, this threshold is something you decide upon what number of percentage of missing value you want to allow in your data set. And that's a call you have to take based on your understanding of the data. So now, obviously, let's... So now let's look at the third idea, which is basically missing value imputation. So now we have all been talking about, you know, let's drop, let's drop, let's drop some row, either drop some columns. But in example, which you see, right, in the example, in the last example, we saw that we dropped all columns, all features, which had greater than 80% missing values. Now, what happens to the rest of the data, right? Uh, there's still data which has got 5%. There are so many columns, features, right, which has basically got more than 5% missing values. There are columns which has got 10% missing values. So, you have got to some way still deal with those missing values and also, Dropping a missing value column is not the best idea always, right? So we have to come up with something which is a bit more sophisticated than just directly dropping. So now this is, we already discussed the approaches we have already. So the problem with most of these approaches that we have discussed as of now is this, that all of these approaches are concerned with missing, you know, dropping some of the data. Sometimes you're dropping some of the rows, sometimes you're dropping some of the columns. Obviously, that's not a good idea. So what we right now want to do is 
do something which is a little more sophisticated, right? Because dropping definitely doesn't sound the most intuitive idea. So what are we gonna do is try and impute the missing value, right? What does impute mean? It's basically nothing but a sophisticated term for replace. So what you're gonna do is every place there's a missing value that you see there, you replace it with some representative value, right? For example, this example, right, that you see on the slide. So it says the fireplace queue column has around 700 missing values, whereas lot frontage has 300 missing values. So you can understand, right, if a fireplace has a missing value, what that probably could imply? Probably that means that there is no fireplace in the house, right? If you don't have a fireplace, how can you even measure the area of a, or probably the area of a fireplace, right? Or if you don't have a frontage, if you don't have a frontage area, right? You cannot measure the area of that particular place, right? So just because this missing value does not mean that, you know, it should probably discard that data away. So let's first few check a few columns from the data, right? So these are the one, these are the ones that you see, right? We had already talked about it. Pool, QC, miscellaneous features, these are some of the ones which have the most number of missing data, right? And then you see garage year built and garage car, right? So garage area. So what does probably a missing value in a garage area probably could imply? It All that it implies is if there's a missing value, probably there's no garage attached with that particular house, right? That's why the area is missing. So in this case, it's a very easy idea that you, intuition that you probably could replace them with a representative value, which is like say zero. Right, a zero area would probably basically imply the same thing as the missing value does in this particular case, right? So what value you replace that with is basically a decision again you have to take and this is something which is completely based on the data that you have at hand, right? For example, garage area, you have to replace it with zero in case you find a missing value, which is basically completely intuitive, right? Because there's no garage in the place, that's why you have a missing value and that's why you replace it with zero, right? So same thing you hear, pool QC, right? So which is basically data description says NA means no pool, right? So obviously if there's no pool, there's no pool area that you can measure along with it, right? So this is fairly intuitive. So in this case, if you have a missing data, it's very easy to replace it with a value which is zero because ideally in real life cases where someone is noting down the value of a house, you know, noting down different characteristics of a house. If you find, if you don't find a pool, you are gonna say no, nothing found here, right? But basically when you're dealing with it in real life and you're trying to kind of impute those when you're trying to come make it into a continuous feature, you can just easily replace that with zero because zero would zero pool area basically means the same thing as a pool is not there, right? So it's very easy to understand all of these concepts, right? The same goes for garage, right? If your garage area built or garage area is zero, that means probably that house does not have garage. And that's why in the first place, that's why you have a missing value in there, right? So for dealing with data, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, while you're trying to pre-process the data, it's very easy and intuitive to understand that in case you have missing value for some features, you could easily replace it with a representative value, right? So that is the third idea. First idea was we miss off, we directly drop out rows. The second idea was a little bit more conservative, which is drop out columns, which I have say higher than 80% of missing values. The third idea is, you know what? Let's not drop anything. Let's try and impute. Impute is basically replace all the missing value with some values, right? So that's what you did. So that's what you did here, right? So you have categorical features which you have replaced it with none and anything which is a numerical features that you have replaced it with zero for garage area, right? So that's what you have done here. So now you see all the, so what you have done here is basically nothing but you are gonna take all the categorical features and replace them with none and all the numerical variables which are features that replace them with zero, right? In this kind of case, it's fairly intuitive to understand why you would do that, right? Because if there's no pool, yeah, no pool. So put a pool area zero, right? So now let's go and understand what is the fifth approach. The fifth approach which we have is uh, sometimes as we can clearly see in this case, right? So we, in this particular case, there was no pool and hence it made sense to replace it with pool areas, you know, the zero value. But in some cases, for example, you are working with data of age, right? Age of different people. Now, if you, if you say dealing with people who got selected to the Indian cricket team and for example, you're dealing with data of age of all of these players. Now, in this case, if you suddenly replace a missing value with zero, that is not the best idea to do, right? Because, um, yeah, who with age zero gets even selected in the Indian cricket team, right? Outlandish. So in that case, you don't want to replace it with zero. You want to replace it with something which is more representative. So what could be more representative? A central measure, right? Anything which is a central measure, right? So in age, if you're looking at all the, all the cricketers who are aged between 15 to 25 who got selected in last two, two and a half year, three years. 
it's fairly intuitive to understand that probably you could replace with the mean of all the age of all the players, right? So in those cases, replacing it with mean or median in case of numeric variables and replacing it with mode in case of categorical variable sounds like an intuitive idea, right? Uh, because you don't want to replace it with zero, you don't want to replace it with some random numbers. Replacing it with the center measure is the most intuitive thing you could do, right? So this is exactly what is mentioned here. So in case of numerical values, for example, frontage area or something like that, where you are, you know, you really don't know, you know that there's missing value, but you know that that value should have been some value, which is it was the center of the distribution. So that's when you replace those values by mean or semi median in case of numeric variable. In case of categorical, you cannot calculate mean or median. So what do you replace it with mode, right? So mode is the most important thing that you can do with categorical features, right? So this is for, to do this, you could directly use something like, you could first calculate the mean separately and then use df.fillna or use something like this, what is shown in the slides, which is basically use something called an imputer. An imputer is nothing, but basically something that takes care of your imputations separately. So all you have to do is basically say, what is the strategy with which you are gonna impute and then that's it, that's or that's absolutely everything is taken care of, right? So the only thing to remember here is though certainly uh, one thing that we are kind of, probably let's talk about that at the end of the session. So now we are gonna discuss about some other techniques uh, about how to impute uh, missing values and we are gonna talk about some more sophisticated algorithms rather than the ones that we have already discussed. So the first one is imputing missing value by using another machine learning model to predict it, right? So for example, you have, as I was explaining, age of Indian cricket players, right? You have that missing. So you could use some other heuristic techniques, right? Or probably some other machine learning mechanism to kind of predict the missing age, right? Using the rest of the variables that you have. So for example, in case of this housing data set, you have all the, see so you have frontage area missing, right? But given the other characteristics of the house, can you predict that in the first place? So that is a machine learning model to predict a missing value. Once you have the missing value predicted, then you're gonna use the entire data for sales price prediction, right? So this is one step uh, ahead of the original machine learning problem that you started off with. Uh, in this machine learning problem, you're gonna predict one of the independent features treating that as a dependent variable. So that is one of the things, uh, the second and more, more I would say, uh, robust way to deal with missing values is basically do the trick of hand, which is basically, instead of changing the data, you know what, change the algorithm. That's much more uh, robust and might as well work out in some of the cases, but definitely just because you have an algorithm that can tackle missing data or that can tackle outlet does not mean necessarily you need to uh, you know, you just can relax about the fact that there's an outlier on missing data. So if your algorithm can take care of missing data and outliers, it's good enough that then probably a small, if, so if your algorithm can take place, or if your algorithm can take care of missing value or outlier, uh, it's fine then you can probably have small outliers, small number of missing values, but if you have a lot of them, then even if you're so most sophisticated of your algorithm would still go for a toss, right? So that's the idea, just because this is something that is robust to outlier or missing value does not mean that you should uh, pass missing value or outlier to that particular algorithm, right? So that's the other approach in how which we can mishandle missing values. And as I've already explained, some of these techniques which we are gonna discuss more in the coming lectures when you're gonna find out about more sophisticated algorithms, you would be able to appreciate why some more algorithms are more robust to missing data. But for now we know that linear and linear regression with L1, L2 regularization and all of that simple linear methods are not robust to missing data. So now the final part of our data pre-processing and cleaning part, which is handling skewness. Now you would be wondering suddenly out of the blue, why is handling skewness such an important thing? Why are we discussing it separately now? Uh, we have not definitely talked about it as much as we have talked about handling outliers or handling missing data. We have been checking that through EDA, but we have not talked as much about skewness. And you tend to probably connect the dots back and able to understand yourself only why is handling skewness an important problem, at least when you're trying to do linear regression, right? When we did linear regression, we had assumed that our most of the, the data that we are using is normally distributed. Now, if you have a skewed data, your data is probably not good for linear regression, right? So that's why we need to take handle skewness separately, at least when we are talking about uh, fitting linear regression, right? 
So this is something that we have already mentioned in that uh, linear regression slides. That's what is there in the slide here. That we have talked about linear regression and we have basically talked why skewness is important. At least not skewness, but we know that uh, why your data needs to be normally distributed for the model to fit perfectly. So given that is the underlying assumption that your data needs to be normally distributed for a linear regression fitting, we need to take care of skewness. If there's skewness, we need to somehow reduce it. So before we go ahead and understand how to handle skewness, let's first understand what is skewness in the first place, right? So this is your normal distribution, standard normal distribution. It's centered around mean equals to zero and sigma equals to one, right? So your mean equals to zero, sigma equals to one, right? So this is your standard normal distribution. And now we are going to see what is a skewed distribution looks like. So this is exactly how a skewed distribution looks like. So this is one variant, the other variant obviously you can guess is this, right? So this is left skewed, so this, sorry, this is right skewed and this is left skewed, right? So this is the underlying assumption. So this is what exactly a skewed distribution looks like. So now that given that you understand what is exactly a skewed distribution, let's try and go ahead and see how you can measure that, right? So how we can, so firstly, in this case, you can clearly see this example, right? Your living area is slightly skewed. It's not definitely as much skewed as the diagram that I had drawn just right now. But you can clearly see there's some asymmetry out here, right? There's the black line that you see here is the perfect normal distribution. The blue line that you see here is the skewed distribution, right? So, so what is exactly how is skewness mathematically calculated? That is part of the resources part along with the lecture slides. So go through it to understand how skewness is calculated. For now, you can directly use this function skew from SciPy and you can directly calculate the skewness which comes out to be 0.56. So what is the me? What is this ideal value for something which is absolutely non-skewed? The ideal value should be zero, right? So this instead of zero, now you have a value which is 0.56, which means that there's somewhat skewness which is part of the distribution, right? So we need to get rid of this skewness. So how do we do this? Uh, as you can see, uh, Let's, so let's just try, try replacing our, how do we, how do you transform data which has got skewness in it? So the first idea is to use something called log transformation. Log transformation is in the, instead of taking the values as it is, which is x1, x2, x3, you take the log values of the same, right? So log x1, log x2, log x3. If you do that, you would probably see that your skewness has gone down. Now let's check the same thing here. So first you do living area, you take, you take a new, data frame, you copy the original data frame and in the new data frame, you change your living area to your log transform of the same, right? So you take your original data, original living area and you take a log of in log in front of that and that is your new living area, right? Now let's see how the data looks like. Now you can see the blue line is quite, quite very much overlapping with the black line that was our original distribution, right? So the skewness, let's also see if the same has hold, does the same thing hold numerically as well. So earlier we had seen our skewness was 0 0.53. Now after the log transform, you can see the skewness has gone down to minus 0 0.22. So this clearly says that log transform probably helps, right? But there's something apart from log transform, which you can also do to reduce skewness. What is that? This is called square root transform. Square root transform is just like large log transformation is taking the square root of the value, right? So you have x1, x2, 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 x3. And in case of log transform, you are taking log x1, log x2, log x3. In case of square root transformation, it's intuitive. You take root of x1, root of x2, root of x3. That's it. So you now again, we do the same thing. Now we plot the square root transform data and you can see here again, the living area is now much more closer to the black curve, right? The black curve is basically the one which is a proper normal distribution. Now let's see again numerically, does this hold true again? We have see, okay, awesome. This is reduced. Earlier my skewness was 0.53. Now it has reduced down to 0.18. That clearly proves that square root transformation probably works, right? Log on to Grey Atom's learning platform to unlock more free content. Subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for regular updates.